call our meeting to order. And this morning we're going to just be discussing H110, an act relating to extending the sunset under uh, 30 VSA subsection 248A, which we often just refer to as 248A. And our first witness is with the Public Utility Commission is joining us via Zoom. Uh, welcome, Greg Bobber. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is actually Greg Faber. Um, I, I work for the uh, PUC, um, and part of my job there is the process 248A application. So you've asked me to come over and give an overview of the 248A process, as I understand it? Yes. Well, I, I could certainly start doing that now if you'd like. I would. Okay, be great. great. Um, so as I said, uh, my name is Greg Faber, and uh, we... we um, we typically process about 140 248A applications a year. Uh, in general, uh, Title 30, Section 248A was created back in 2007 to allow for a statewide level review of the siting of the telecommunications facilities. The section sets forth the requirements for the applications and allows the PUC to develop rules or orders governing the process. Prior to 248A, all facilities needed Act 250 and town approval. Um, Section 248A is optional, meaning that a telecom provider today could choose to go through the town level review process instead of using 248A. In my experience though, most if not all providers now use the 248A process. Uh, the PUC has created standards and procedures that govern the application process and these in turn are based on the statutory requirements set forth in Section 248A. Uh, the application process is divided into three main categories. So you have small projects or de minimis modifications as they're called in the statute. Uh, these typically consist of swapping out antennas or equipment like a generator at an existing facility or possibly co-locating um, equipment on a building or another existing structure, uh, such as a farm silo. So these are your smaller applications and they, these comprise the majority of the applications that we get. Um, and then the next category is medium or limited size and scope projects. Now these can entail the construction of a small facility with a tower of up to 140 feet tall and some limited um, earth disturbance, um, or they could include more significant modifications than limited size and scope modifications to an existing facility. And then the rest are the larger projects, and these involve the construction of new facilities with larger towers and more earth disturbance. So you have the three categories. Um, now the, the rules or our standards and procedures require notice for these applications. So for medium and large projects, applicants have to provide 60 days advance notice of the application to the town, the regional planning commission, adjoining landowners and state agencies, including ANR, DHP, and the Department of Public Service. Um, once the application is filed uh, with the PUC and the entities that receive the advance notice, and this would be 60 days after they file it. The, the parties that receive the application have 30 days to file comments and file motions, request hearings, that sort of thing. Um, for de minimis projects, the, the, the smaller ones, uh, there's no advance notice requirement, the app, but the application goes to the town, the department, and the landowner of the project site. Parties still have 30 days to file comments or motions on those projects as well. Uh, and now, let's see, oh, there's, so the application uh, or the standards and procedures require certain information be provided by the applicants in order to get approval. Um, for non-de minimis or larger projects, uh, the standards require applicants to provide information on existing permits, a detailed project description with site plans and elevation drawings, signal uh, propagation or coverage maps, they have to show consistency with all the applicable environmental and aesthetic criteria, including things like wetlands, natural areas, floodways, endangered species, historic sites, and other, all the Act 250 criteria, basically. 
Um, they also have to show consistency with the town and regional plans, and they have to show um, co-location opportunities if indeed this involves building a new tower. Um, for de minimis applications, as you can imagine, there's less information provided, but they need they still need to provide a site plan and show that the project qualifies as a de minimis modification. Um, Let's see, oh, so once we get all this information uh, for projects of limited size and scope, the PUC uh, is required to issue a decision within 60 days if there are no significant issues or 90 days where we do have significant issues. And for larger projects, we're required to issue a decision within 60 days if there aren't any significant issues and 180 days if there are. Um, and that's a statutory requirement. So. That's the basic overview. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about specifics that the committee might have. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, sounds like maybe, oh, oh, maybe that goes over. Um, do folks have questions? <clears throat> Can you talk about the difference between the Act 250 um, and the PUC public good. So that's that's the sort of, as I understand it, the significant difference between the way that the PUC looks at the um, these types of projects versus an Act 250 review of them. Yeah, that is a difference between Act 250 and uh, the PUC. So at, in Act 250 world, um, a project must comply with all of the criteria or, or it can't be approved, period. Um, in the, in the, at the PUC, a project could fail one of the Act 250 criteria, and we could override that failure by saying that the project, even though it does not meet this criteria, is in the public good in spite of that. Um, it has such an overarching public good that even in spite of failing that criteria, we, we would approve it anyway. The, that's the difference between um, Act 50 and, and the PUC. Um, however, uh, we seldom use that. That is very seldom used. Uh, typically, if a project does not meet the criteria, it does not get approved. And when you do use it, how is it applied? Like, is there a standard kind of sequence of questions you? or yeah how does no it, it would be project dependent um the last time i remember it being used was on a large wind project um that was several years ago and i forget what cr criteria it didn't meet but uh things like that um it, it's really project dependent and does every tower need to go through this process yes uh, but again keep in mind that it is optional um, a telecom provider could choose to go through the Act 250 process and the town level review. So, but if they do enter into 248A, obviously they have to go through this process. Representative Pat. So, uh, technically, uh, you mentioned a, a, a wind project. That would have been a section 248, not a 248A, if, if I'm correct. That's right. I, I, we've never used this in a 248A setting, uh, Representative Pat. Yeah, 248 is is the older part of the statute that deals with uh, energy um, siting uh, issues and was adapted for telecom by making 248A uh, a little bit later on. Mm. That's right, yeah. It's sort of a carve out of 248A project or 248 projects. <laughs> Okay, Representative Bongard. So would an, would, an, would an application under the 248A process look the same in many ways as an application for an Act 250 project? Do, you, uh, are the, do they go you know, through all the 10 criteria and all the sub-criteria with the same level of uh, analysis and review that would happen in the, in the 250 process, or is it somehow different? Um, it's similar when, when it comes to the Act 250 criteria. We use, we use, do we use the same criteria? Um, we, we both use the same criteria. 248A has um, uh, 
um, some of the criteria are waived in the statute. So we don't use all of the criteria. Uh, so it is similar, but it does have some differences. Okay, because some are statutorily waived. That's correct. Okay. And just, you, well, I can look them up, it doesn't matter. Members have further questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Representative <laughs> Sibelia. Yeah, Greg, can you help me understand um, or just uh, kind of high level contrast um, the 248A and um, the use of that for telecommunications and when we are um, building out uh, or replacing electric lines um, with end poles. So, and, and here's why I'm asking. So those systems are, are really, they're, I mean, they're <laughs> mutually dependent at, at right now at, in terms of the build out. Um, you know, we have fiber being strung out on those poles. We have a lot of those poles being replaced. Uh, at the same time, we have a lot of our utilities um, trying to underground and do work on, uh, on, on hardening their lines because of um, weather. So I'm just trying to understand how those two things might kind of come together. Uh, well, I guess the short answer is that they don't. 248A is for wireless telecommunications only. So wired uh, okay. telecommunications would would not fall under uh, 248A. Okay, great. All right, anything else you can provide for us? <coughs> that I can. Uh, in terms of the updates, why is it updating? That's all right. So, you could ask. Um, so uh, I guess I would be curious about why um, this section of statute expires and needs updating regularly. That, that is a very good question. I am not, not entirely sure. Um, this comes up for Sunset roughly every two, three years, and it's been doing so for quite a long time. I'm not really sure why, if the legislature thinks this is a good idea and it promotes the build out of wireless, um, and that is a goal of the legislature, why you wouldn't do away with the sunset, but I, I really can't explain that one. Representative Sibelia. So I, I would note, it has been my experience in the past, Madam Chair, that a number of the wireless companies have been fairly careless in their placements. Uh, and uh, a number of legislators in the past have wanted to not reauthorize this and have been mollified with the, we'll see you in three years and make right. sure things are going well. Okay, continuous check-in. Yes. Sure. Got it. Um. <clears throat> Further questions? Representative Pat. I just uh, add my, my uh, understanding also in terms of past legislators reasoning was there was some concern about the um, the more expedited uh, type of uh, uh, provisions in, in, in the statute as to, as to whether there was sufficient review of those. So they wanted mm -hmm. past legislators, I'm not talking about myself, uh, wanted um, a, a check back and a further review on, on, on that issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Greg, I want to go back to my fir my first question and just with the utilities and I'm going to use the wrong analogy, but they're uh, the uh, is it AMI devices that they're putting on their houses. Avram, help me. The um, the for uh, managing their energy. Um, I'll come back. I, I'm not prepared to ask a good question here, so I'm going to not take okay. up any time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us. Um, are you are you able to to stick around for a few more minutes, in case we get? Absolutely. Have... Yeah. Thank you. All right. I'll be here. Thanks. All right. So our next witness is Jim Porter, who's also joining us via Zoom. Thank you. Um, good to be here this morning. I'm Jim Porter. I'm the director for public advocacy at the department. 
And one thing I do remember um, going back to your question about this, the sunset provision was when this was established, um, if, if, if you don't know, there are three categories of projects that fit within 248A. Um, there are de minimis, which are basically um, the replacement of existing or upgrade of existing antennas on structures that are already there. There's limited size and scope, which is um, a smaller tower. And then there's a full 248A, which is a brand new, what you think of as a typical cell tower. The de minimis um, category is very strict and you really can't increase the size or um, <clears throat> scope of what's already there. And I know that when we were setting these up years ago with the legislature, there was concern about companies maybe trying to take advantage of the de minimis category. And I, I can say that to this day, the PUC continues to to view the view de minimis petitions very strictly, um, as, as do we. And I think that concern has not necessarily borne out. Um, one, one thing I would say about the department's participation, as, as Greg said, the department and A&R are statutory parties in all of these. And one thing that we changed about 248A a few years back was that during the, and I should also say the vast majority of petitions we get are de minimis, which are basically upgrades to, um, the, to, to the existing antennas and radios on these structures. But um, one thing that I think is a little unique about 248A is the department, sometimes if there are aesthetics concerns, we will hire an independent aesthetics expert to review a project. And sometimes we will retain a radio frequency engineer who can look at you know, where it I think most often comes up is if a, a viable alternate site is proposed, then we can have someone do an analysis to say, you know, if you moved this proposed tower from site A to B, would you get the same amount of coverage? And, and that has been successful. But typically, under statute, the department has the ability to retain these experts and bill it back to the petitioner. And so one thing that was changed about 248A that I do think has been successful in many instances is once a notice is filed, um, we were also given the ability to hire experts during that period. Um, the, the town can request a meeting where the company, the petitioner has to come in and explain the project. And the department is able to retain um, experts during the notice period before the petition's ever filed. Because as Greg said, once the petition is filed, there are certain time limitations that are, are kind of are put on it. And so we have had some success. And you know, most of these petitions come through and they are really not contested. But sometimes like um, certain solar projects, a notice will come in and you just get enormous um, opposition from the town as to where it's proposed to be placed. Um, one company in particular literally bends over backwards, in my opinion, trying to work with the communities. Um, and then the other companies are perhaps a little lesser in that. But we've really had some good success stories in um, during this notice time in meeting with the, the communities and, and the affected neighbors and trying to come up with a solution that works for everybody um, generally before the petition is even filed, if that's at all helpful. But I, I do think that's an important piece to note. Um, and I guess with that, are there any questions that I can answer about our review or about how these things kind of work generally? Yeah, um, thank you for that. So solar goes through 248 or 248A? 248. Okay. Uh, do folks have questions? 
for the Public Service Department. Can you tell us how you do review the projects? Like kind of walk us through, you get an application? Sure, an application comes in and it goes to our telecom division. And one of the things they look at is a telecom engineer sort of does a checks to make sure that the structural analysis that's been provided um, is sufficient. And that that's really just to ensure that the, the thing's not gonna fall down um, as proposed um, and then go through and we will review whether there's an aesthetics issue. Um, there has to be in the petition, depending upon the type, uh, um, some type of aesthetics review. And typically what we do, unless we see something that just doesn't look right to us, we rely on um, comments from neighbors or the town. And if anybody raises an aesthetics issue, then we really just automatically hire an aesthetics expert to, to look at the project. Um, and, then, and then we will make a recommendation to the PUC um, in, in all cases as well. And um, as I say, the vast majority of these petitions are not litigated. Um, sometimes though, when they are, they can go on for quite a while. Thank you, Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you, were, you were just speaking a, minute, a second ago about aesthetics uh, involving any particular projects. Does that apply to government projects? Yeah, yes, sir. Like fe federal government uh, have put towers up along the border and Derby Line, and uh, to the objections of all three of our legislative people in Washington D.C. And aesthetics didn't in it, did not enter into the picture at all. Well, let me ask you though: Are those? Um, I know what you're talking about. I, I'm not sure those have come through us for permitting and, and uh, are you talking about the the towers that have been put up for for the monitoring yes i am the, those we don't they don't come to us I, i'm not familiar unless greg can think of any of those um coming to us do, do those projects answer to anyone do you know Th that is um that's a good question. Some years ago, we had a, um, a a solar project that was being built, I think, by Homeland Security, and um, that 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 one, I believe, that one was permitted. So I, I'm not familiar with our getting any of these federal tower permits. I, I remember one that came before the PUC that was a, a federal solar project. All right. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if this is a question for you, um, which which one of you this might be a question for, um, but I guess I'm curious how the public notice works. Uh, in my area, we had a tower appear, and certainly I I wasn't, I didn't know about it coming. <laughs> And <clears throat> it's on the edge of the wilderness area up in the Green Mountain National Forest. And it, I'm just curious how many people might have even been aware of it before it was going to go up and how they would have found out about it. I, I think, and Greg will correct me where I'm wrong, but I think the notice is to the, the municipal bodies um, and adjoining landowners and the relevant state agencies. Yeah, and there's uh, very few landowners up there. Interesting. <laughs> Representative Bongar. This is just this. This is a new area to me. So what? What's what goes through two forty eight and what goes through two forty eight a? What? Where's the? Where's the line of demarcation? So so two forty eight a is exclusively um, dealing with telecommunication or cellular facilities, telecom facilities. 
And then 248A really all deals, I mean, 248, you know, deals with um, electric generation projects. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to ask oh, Representative Sebelia. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Jim. Uh, morning. With regard to these um, structures or antennas or other items that are put up, uh, does the department um, have the ability to um, to weigh in on what those are intended to do? Uh, you know, what kind of coverage they're intended to provide um, at all? <clears throat> So typically, I think, the, you know, going back to 248 projects, there are some projects that you look to see if it's the least cost alternative. And, and there are criteria that deal with, you know, is there an economic benefit to the state? Um, so as, as far as that goes, I think the fact that it is the company's and without benefit of public investment that are fronting the money for these projects, that that does not um, come into play. I can tell you that if someone is willing to um, increase the cellular coverage somewhere, I, I'm not. I think it, you would have a wide variance of people that say what's in the public good. You know, if it if it offers any additional coverage, um, which, you know, then I think a lot of people might say that is in the public good. These companies though, typically are trying to maximize the coverage for the money that they're spending. Um, if, if that answers your question at all. It starts to, uh, when, uh, do you have the ability to say you know, where is the coverage going to be to monitor um, where the coverage is and to do anything if the coverage is not where it was supposed to be? So I know. So those are, it's, and Jim, I want to just interrupt you because those three questions are important to me. So if you could answer each of those three questions. Well, let me try to answer those for you. Last year, and I believe this year in the governor's budget, there was a proposal to, or and is a proposal to take a certain amount of money and to identify locations where cellular coverage is needed, and then to go through a process with the communities where these are located and do outreach and try to um, find areas where we need the cell coverage and where the communities are um, open to hosting those. In those instances, which would be funded through the state, I think we absolutely have that um, ability and that's something that I think we would do without question. That's kind of built into the proposal. An interesting thing that came up this year is... Jim? Yeah. You said in those types of proposals, you would have the ability for all three of the questions to ask them where the coverage is going to be, to monitor if the coverage has gone there, and to do something about it if it is not there. That that's correct. But I'll absolutely that's correct under under that proposal. One thing I will tell you though, this year this year for the first time that I can remember. We had a company um, and they are seeking permits for, it's a private radio network that's really made available to businesses. And it does not, you know, typically when a petition comes in, we know that it's gonna be an AT&T tower or a Sprint tower or a Verizon tower. These did not come with that. And so essentially I think they were building these as spec towers. We had one of those that for the first time I can remember, it was very much opposed in the community where it was 
proposed. And we were going to make an argument that it was not in the public good because there was not a broader public um, use that would come from this unless somebody happened to locate on it after it was built. That tower actually was withdrawn. And I am frankly, the statute does not require it. And I don't really know that that would be a good thing. But in that instance, that's the first time I remember we were going to make that public good argument. I'm not sure we would have prevailed, but we were willing to try. But as I say, that tower, that proposed tower got pulled. So, uh, Jim, I just want to clarify what I believe you said and, and what you did not say. So I believe you said uh, governor has a proposal for public towers uh, and that the department has or believes that they would have some regulatory um, oversight there in terms of coverage. Um, and what you did not say is uh, right now existing, um, uh, you know, not those um, proposed public towers, existing towers. Do you have that ability to uh, find out, you know, ask for what the coverage is going to be, monitor if the coverage is there, and then do something if it is not what was asked for? Currently. So, okay. Um... That's a good question. So, as you know, when the, when these when the petitioners come in, they have to file coverage maps um, of of where they think the coverage will be um, be if the, if they build it. And we have hired people to do analyses of what they propose for coverage and. You know, sometimes they're in the ballpark. Sometimes they're not. the the one th The one thing about that that I've learned over the years is when you're talking about the coverage of a cell tower, um, there are very scientific people who do this. But I think at the end of the day, and I think the providers will tell you, until the radios are actually installed and um, calibrated and operational. I, I, I don't think you entirely know what the coverage is gonna be. I think there's somewhat of an art to that. And, you know, a lot of it depends upon um, that, you know, are the leaves on, are the leaves off? And so it's a very, um, un unlike in a solar project where, you know, it has to be built here and it has to have this spec and that's a very easy thing to monitor and to and that happens on occasion you know they don't build them as they're supposed to but you can go out and the engineer can say yes they have built it 150 feet away from where they got a permit to build it they got to move it the the coverage is a little bit of a harder thing to to prove does that does that make any sense uh it doesn't make sense can you do anything about it if it's not uh as uh as promised i i i would have to think about that a bit um if, if the, what i'm thinking is if we if we chose to bring a petition about that i think that you would have dueling RF experts and um, Excuse I, me, I, Jim, I what's RF? What's RF? Oh, radio frequency. It's the, yeah, the, the cover, where, where the signal goes. Um, okay. But, but we have certainly done that, you know, I think recently um, during the pandemic, there was some emergency money and we funded some fixed wireless locations for broadband. And we absolutely went out and did um, individual testing of, of every site that was funded. Uh, the department went to every site that was funded and tested it itself and did not ask for attestations 
from the fixed wireless providers. Is that correct? I'm really not the person. I know that we do ask for attestations. Um, I know that in projects that we have funded, I, I think we have done um, our own. Or when I say our own, we've either retained somebody, we've retained someone to go out, or we have had them provide the testing. And I think at times we've been on site. But I'm six years removed from telecom. and. Um, I, I would have to, if I've told you anything wrong, I will correct it. But that that's what I believe we've done. Okay, so it, I think it would be helpful to make sure that we're clear on whether or not self-attestation was a part of the COVID, um, the COVID insta wireless installations. Because I, I believe that it was, Jim, it's, you know, so... I, I believe it was too, and I, I've actually had a conversation recently with it with the guys in the telecom division, and um, they are confident that the project and the projects funded for that were verified to their satisfaction. Yeah, I, I know that they are. I, I've also had those conversations. We've had some pretty significant, as you know, you and I have worked on um, some pretty significant uh, failures of self-attestation in the past, massive failures of that. And so that's why I'm looking for this distinction. Madam Chair, I actually found the question, the, the information that I was looking for with Greg. May I ask that? It, it, Jim may be able to answer as well. Yes. Okay. So uh, just going back to um, the AMI, uh, I'm going to now, the, I'm gonna, that is the right thing. It's the advanced. Um, Thank you, Representative Tory, for the lifeline. So uh, with regard to that, uh, d does AMI uh, utilize Act 248A? That, that, and that is, um, it's a system of managing um, load. Um, yes, but I, I'm shaking his head. Maybe you could throw me another lifeline oh, from, from but uh, yeah what is it advanced what metering, metering infrastructure. infrastructure yes <coughs> so uh, our utilities are installing this so that um mm. hold please uh it's technology composes sev several elements consumption meters and two-way communications channels in a data repository and it's really meant to help manage what's going it, it it's part of smart metering, mm. smart homes, uh, modernizing our grid, uh, helping to reduce emissions, having a lot of flexibility. So the AMI projects, I, I know that uh, GMP um, is largely done with that. Some of our um, co-ops may be done with that. I know our munis are working on that, our municipal utilities. So do those AMI projects utilize 248A? Avram's going to say no. No, they, they do not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Pat. I could just add anything that's part of the distribution system is not covered. Uh, okay. if, if, as part of AMI, they had to build a facility somewhere, that might be. But the, the you know running of lines on, on the poles and um, uh, putting different, changing out different kinds of meters in people's homes. Is part of the distribution system and wouldn't wouldn't be covered. Some AMI is wireless. Hmm. Some of the AMI is wireless, correct? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You know, if a if a tower uh, or that that kind of facility needed to be built in order for the AMI to work, that that might. But the actual services to people's homes would would not be. Right. So it's a tower. But the. Representative Sibilia, if I can stretch my memory for a minute to the member about 10 years ago when Bell, when Vermont got the first big grant for the AMI implementation and Green Mountain Powers was a wireless solution. And I do seem to remember that for they may have used existing um an existing carrier to assist, to assist and where they needed a little extra coverage. But I think that I don't think anything was built for that. I think it was, um, so 
I, th I think Greg is correct. 248A is is not used for that, but it's a little. I do think some systems have used cellular providers in, in assisting in areas. Right. Did members have further questions about Representative Morris and then Tori? Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, gentlemen, for being here this afternoon, or this morning, uh, <laughs> post copy, so yeah, it could be afternoon. Um, is during the permitting process, and I know uh, a lot of times the emergency <laughs> communication uh, towers or, or radios uh, get installed on these uh, sites uh, and the wireless sites. And I'm wondering, is there any consideration for that in the permitting process for the, the public good? And then I have another follow-up question. So emergency services, are they considered in the permitting process for the location of these wireless towers, et cetera? You want me to take this, Jim, or? Sure. Um, so there's really no, um, let's see. So usually if you're putting antennas on a tower, that would fall under a de minimis modification, whether it's for, de min for emergency services or for expansion of, uh, let's say, AT&T service. Uh, there, there would really be no distinction between that. It's usually the very small ones. And all you really have to show is that it qualifies as a really small modification. That makes sense, thank you. Uh, my, sec my second question is a more of a comment, I think. Uh, being involved in emergency services and wireless communication uh, between uh, base station and, and the units on the scene, uh, we call them dead spots, but it's within a coverage area, but occasionally we run into issues where for some reason, one, one reason or another, the radio communications don't go through, whether it's a line of sight or the the terrain of Vermont's hills and valleys, or whether it was mentioned, uh, whether it's in the fall uh, or in the summertime when there's leaves covering the trees versus uh, uh, this time of year. But uh, and I just comment on uh, if, a, if a utility was gonna promise that they could cover a certain area that the expectations of 100% households, 100% of the time uh, does come within, uh, does come with some, uh, uh, issues with the communication, then they might not be covered at certain times. Uh, I, that's just experience that I have from EMS services and uh, with our radio transmissions. Representative Tory. Thank you. Um, my question is about the notice to adjoining landowners, and I'm just wondering how you define adjoining. Is it very narrowly defined, especially as you're talking about larger product, mm -hmm. projects? Uh, I, I guess I could answer this. Um, uh, basically, it's it, it's if it, if your property is touching the the uh, the the property where the the project is going to be cited. Um, I mean, that's the basic rule of thumb. I mean, you could be across the street, and if if your properties go to the middle of middle of the street as they do in some towns, then that would be considered adjoining as well. Um, but basically, it's the people, the neighbors surrounding the, the uh, project site property. Thanks. So, members, I, <clears throat> I recommend that you pull up the section of statute uh, and peruse it, if not read it thoroughly. <laughs> um, um, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this morning. It was very helpful. I'm not seeing any further questions. Uh, and I think with that, we'll take a five minute break, seven minute break, and come back at five minutes before the hour. We're going to reconvene our morning that, meeting call. and welcome Rob Vitsky, the director of Fukuda. <laughs> welcome. Good morning, um, and thank you for having us back. Um, uh, the, the team had a great time with you yesterday talking about uh, CVs and such, and so I won't do a renewal on that, but appreciate the invite. Um, to talk about 248A this morning. And uh, I think as you heard this morning, uh, for most telecommunications facilities that don't go high up in the air, um, this isn't used very often. 
Um, but we did want to kind of set some context for you for the way we cite equipment around the state. Um, and the, the, you know, the synthesis where we might consider trying to go to the data. It'll be pretty quick. So um, I'm assuming there are no more questions about what a communications union district is, um, but the slide's there for the record, and if you have any questions, of course, we'd like to answer them. So here's a picture um, of Montpelier. And uh, in the green lines here, you see the way um, uh, telecommunications lines might be run. And these would be run on poles or underground, this is just meant to be representative of the kinds of things that we think about. So we need to cite equipment um, in these pole sheds to support these customers. And you know, there's some limitations. There are distance limitations. For instance, we need to be within about 12 and a half miles of our equipment to the farthest home. Um, that can be reduced by the number of uh, places we have to drop along the way. We have these things called splitters. Um, and optical light gets split. And as it, you, the, farther, the more splitters you have, uh, the less light um, you have. And so you need to kind of size um, the service area uh, based on the number of splitters and the number of homes you're serving. We look at um, the layout of the poles. And you know, obviously, you have to have continuity from point A to point B, from your, um, the center of your, where your service and your equipment is to the farthest point. Um, we look at things like power and where it's going to be most reliable. Um, and how where it's least likely to go out. If we could be at a substation, for instance, that would be a better location than being at the end of a, a single fed street. Um, we look at interconnectivity to other parts of the network. So what are, where are the intersections of the fiber rings to other towns and other hub sites um, and other parts of the network that give us resiliency? We look at security of the site. We look at environmental issues, like we wouldn't want to be in the bottom of a flood water. Um, so there are a number of things, parking and serviceability, the ability to drive up and change a car or um, not have it be plowed in in the winter. Um, and of course, the, probably the most important for one for us is the host site's willingness to host us. Um, and if we can find synergies, and I'll talk a little bit about that with, with host sites. So these are kind of constraints that we look at. Um, you know, unsurprisingly, in this map, you'd probably look somewhere right here in the middle um, between the two major service areas, if you could, to site one, one set of equipment um, to serve both areas. Okay. So oh, I didn't put on full screen, sorry. Okay, so this is what um, the vast majority of the hundreds of equipment cabinets we're gonna be siting around the state look like. And so you know, EC Fiber's already done this, they probably have dozens of these out there. Um, you know, as I talked to the other CEDs uh, in preparation for today, this is very typical of what they're citing. Typically, we'll go on the side of the road, set back enough that, um, uh, you know, again, snow and access and other things. Um, so, any questions on the picture? No? Okay. Um, so, in the, that's, that's a typical site. Forward. Um, you know, in the large sites, we, we might place a temporary building or a, a you know, prefab building like this. Or more typically, um, in the way the CEDs are working, we work with the town to find a location. So here's a site in Peachum where we're locating at their fire station. There's some benefit there. We might have shared backup power, for instance. Um, it's I was obviously a highly accessible location that's going to be available year round and probably has reasonable power um, uh, and, uh, and service load. So in the case of the self-contained hunt, we're not doing many of these in Vermont, but um, you know, we might do something like this. These buildings come in various sizes. You see these at the bottom of towers as well. Um, but for us, you know, it wouldn't obviously be at a tower site. Um, but sometimes they have a generator in them, sometimes they have fuel. So there are, there are considerations about where you place them um, and, uh, and what they might be. They might have a battery bank in them, et cetera. So the difference between this and the previous slide, the smaller equipment is that is a generator or other so so the smaller sites um typically in this cabinet the top half of the cabinet is equipment and fiber patch you know, and the bottom is batteries and a lot of cds um with their operating partner have strategies for backup power in some cases uh, they will site a small generator there um and either bury a tank or put you know a propane tank or some of the fuel source um in a lot of cases what they'll do is they'll put 14 to 24 hours of batteries, and they'll have a generator on a truck. So that in a power failure, they've got 14 to 20 hours to get a generator out there. Mm -hmm. They'll plug it in, and then they'll run a portable generator during an outage. But that's the difference between these two facilities. One has it sort of 
Yeah, it's also just size. That so the, the you know for every network you may have one big hub site or maybe let's say two um, where you connect to the rest of the world. You have additional equipment. Um, so you know the the pure distribution sites that are just serving homes look like this. Okay. But for each network, there are you typically one site that's a little bigger and has more gear, and that would go in the bigger builder. And a network is that twelve and a half miles or no? Uh, so. Again, based on sizing, you might be able to serve a 12 and a half mile radius with one of these one tablets. Of mm -hmm. um, but typically with any CDD, you'd see some larger facility that had more capacity. Um, this type of rack typically just supports just the equipment called the OLT that serves the homes. Whereas in a site like this, you might have the routers and switches that connect to the internet. You might have caching um, some of the providers like um, Akamai, Google, YouTube actually provide local caching um, for content. So you might have additional equipment beyond just the distribution equipment in a large site. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, what you really want to hear about is our take on 248. Um, so far, is we uh, in, in canvassing all the CUDs, no one has used 248. Hey, we have um, been working with the local municipalities um, and siting equipment uh, in collaboration with them and then following the laws as appropriate um, for local site. And so um, you could have used this as an alternate path for siting. Uh, you know, if you read this definitions in 248A, it is clear that this is for two-way telecommunications facilities. It typically is used for towers, um, but it does appear to be an avenue through which you could site equipment if you needed to. Um, and so we uh, appreciate that additional avenue. We have not had to use it so far. Um, we support the three-year renewal. Uh, you know, in general, um, we think that's a, a nice sunset. We're going to be building for more than three more years. It's nice to have a check-in, make sure that um, you know, as conditions change or such, we have the ability to uh, make modifications if needed. Um, we don't see any at this point, um, but we do support the three-year check-in. And then the last one is, um, you know, the, the group felt it was important just to convey to you both that having statewide standards for telecommunications cited are important. And in contentious situations, provide an additional avenue to make sure that um, we can fulfill the certificate of public good uh, for um, general purpose use. But we also really are, you know, we are community based organizations, we are bottom up grassroots <clears throat> organizations. We also think it's really important to have local input in citing decisions. Um, and so that's the path we've chosen, is to go local. Um, and I expect we will continue to go that way. That's it. Thank you. Uh, what, so what process do you use, or do you have to go through to site, or to, I mean, you're using existing infrastructure largely. So what is your requirement there? Yeah, so for the most part, um, so, uh, we simply work with the towns, and as we have close relations with them through their, um, you know, their decision to form a CUD, there is support in the statute um, for towns to provide um, a location for us to site equipment for each town that joins, that votes to join. Um, one of the provisions is that they work with us to find a, a provision to locate equipment. We don't always need to put one in every town. Um, so depending, again, like the scenario I showed on the map, it might be that the edge of one town and that can serve two towns. Mm. Um, but we, go, we generally go through the local approval process. In the case where we're going inside a building, um, there is no siting. Um, in the case where uh, you know, we, um, we're going on someone's property, let's say the town's property, we just follow their local ordinances and their local approval process. And so there's no state level review? Correct. And that's, and that's the process we've been using. It's been working for us. You certainly can see you know, we do operate in a competitive environment um, where someone could try and stop site someday in the coming years that hasn't happened yet. Thank you. Do members have questions? Great. Thanks. Well, thank you again. Yep. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> So next, we are going to welcome Karen Horn from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Welcome Morning. for the first time this year. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Karen Horn with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and uh, a few, a couple of you I have not met before. So um, we're the association of all the 247 cities and towns around the state, 
and we follow all the legislation that might affect a municipality, which works out to be somewhere around 250 to 300 bills a, a year. Because we're a um, Dillon's rural state, and I can go into that some other time, but essentially, um, if a town wants to do something that's not already allowed in the statutes, we need to seek permission from the legislature to do it. We, as an association, we also provide insurances to municipalities through risk, risk pools and um, technical assistance, legal advice to any local official about the responsibilities of their jobs, not the job of the person in the next office, their job. So um, sometimes an important distinction at the local level. Um, so thank you for having me um, come talk about 248A. We do support the extension of the sunset. And um, I've been here for about 110 years. So when this um, was initially adopted, the, the um, system was that, that was in place was that municipalities could permit telecommunications uh, facilities. And um, that, and, and we had a model telecommunications bylaw that a lot of town, towns adopted, but there were other versions as well. And so the industry um, was, was concerned that it was scattershot, right? Which is often the case with um, local bylaws. And so they asked for the Public Utility Commission, then the Public Service Board, to, to be the regulatory entity. And um, the legislature didn't go the whole way down that path. They put in the, the three-year sunset, which has been renewed several times now. If this were to lapse, our understanding is that the authority would revert to the local governments. So, um, and so, so that would be one result. And if you were to make it permanent, um, we feel fairly strongly that there wouldn't be the requirement for a, for a check-in with the legislature on a periodic basis. And technology changes a lot. Um, what towns are trying, what, what telecommunications um, companies are trying to do uh, changes a lot. And, and so we think that the three-year sunset is a pretty important feature. Uh, I did send to uh, Kate, um, just for your information, right now there's a proposal for a Verizon cell tower in um, Warren. And uh, my understanding is that the, that the application's actually been withdrawn, so they were going to come talk to the community, but they've, um, because they're not proceeding right now, they're revising their application that the that that period for discussion um, isn't happening right now, and they have not, right? Re Representative Torres, my new rep, is also my neighbor up the hill, so um, we're delighted she's here. Um, but they they haven't actually met with the town yet. So and then and then I also. Um, sent you an informational piece that the town of Warren put, uh, um, Planning Commission put together around the um, 248A process and sort of answering frequently asked questions from the community. And I think it gives you a good idea of the range of questions that um, people ask when a big cell tower um, is proposed in the community. And there's always, the, the only other thing I really need to point out, or actually don't need to point out, is that there's always this tension between people wanting good service and people not wanting a tower um, right next door to them. So, uh, so that's something that, um, in fact, the Public <coughs> Utility Commission might be better able to mediate than some communities who might actually be neighbors to a um, facil proposed facility. And so they're better, and that's the process we have now is the PUC. Regulation. That's what you have. So um, to, to the point just made with the communications union districts, a, a business actually has a choice. They can go the local level, or they can go to the utility commission. And most, I mean, I think that the, um, the cell companies, I think they always go to the public utility commission. I, uh, 
So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you happen to know who put this document together um, from the Warren, the frequently asked questions? I think that um, it was the uh, Planning Commission that put it together. They, they did have a bylaw. Um, well, it's still on the books in Warren and, and in a lot of other communities. The, they, there is a bylaw that um, addresses the regulation of cell towers, and it's pretty much our model bylaw that we put out years ago. But um, yeah, I think the Planning Commission put that together. Great. This is really very helpful. Um, I encourage members to check it out. It's under um, Karen Horn's name on our webpage. I'm not seeing the Warren application up. Um, did you send that in also? Well, no, it's been withdrawn. Oh, I thought you mentioned though that you sent it in anyway. So, um, no, I sent you, I sent you two things. I sent the frequently asked questions, and what else did I send you? Now I forget. Two forty eight. Two forty eight A. Okay. Well, yeah. So there's only one thing up from Karen. So if you could check on that, it'd be great. Yeah. I might have just sent you the language. Did you just it's, it's up there now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the my understanding is that there's not an actual application right now from Verizon for that tower. They're they're revisiting that. Great. Do members have questions? Representative Pat. Um, just curious in in your experience if, if if applicants are going to the town rather than um, have, using the option of, of going to the town are there projects I mean the, the reason for 248a or 248 um, as in the, in the, the public good issue is that frequently I mean a, a, a facility a tower will be located in one town but it will also extend right. service to people in the neighboring town um, so you don't want those one town having the you know, yeah. you know so i just wonder how much that that uh if your experience whether there, there's any issues around 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 that where where the uh the the town where uh, a proposed facility would be located uh the the facility would actually be serving people in a broader area oh i i, I think that certainly the case that that facilities will serve more than one town. And my understanding is that almost all the applications go to the Public Service Board. And if it's a de minimis application, you know, which, as, as Greg said, most of them are, um, you know, that there's sort of a truncated process. But I think that it was kind of a revelation to me, I admit, that, that the communications union districts have made the choice to go um, locally versus uh, 248A. And we're also in a communications union district, and I'm waiting with bated breath, as Representative Civilian Torre know, for my um, high-speed internet service. I've been waiting about 15 years, but yeah. So, anyway, we're happy to come back, and if need be. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. All right, next up we have Owen Smith um, from AT&T Vermont, and he'll be joining us via Zoom. Welcome, Owen. Owen, are you with us? He's the host. I am, can you hear me? We can. Good morning, and <clears throat> thank you for um, having me and uh, nice to see you all, uh, some new faces in the committee. But um, Chair Sheldon and Vice Chair Sebelia, members of the committee, um, again, I thank you for this opportunity to um, testify in support of 248A and, um, and uh, for the House Bill uh, 110. My name is Owen Smith. And I'm the uh, state president for AT&T here in Vermont. So, um, AT&T's AT ability to invest um, and increase the number of towers in the state by almost 30% since 2019 <clears throat> um, is in large part due to 248A, uh, which is a very workable, um, efficient wireless permitting process for both the municipalities, which I think we just uh, heard, and also from uh, certainly a company's perspective. Um, that's why I'm advocating that um, the committee not only renew 248A, but consider extending um, it permanently 
um, or at least sunset um, after uh, 10 years, but which would be extremely helpful in our planning. Um, so extending and, and uh, or repealing the sunset clause will provide AT&T and the industry with greater certainty to plan out our network investments and the construction of cell towers, providing Vermonters with a better wireless experience. So just a, a, a quick history of what we've done, AT&T has done um, over the past few years. Um, in fact, over the past five years, we've invested about $100 million on our Vermont network. <clears throat> we've added 51 uh, additional cell sites um, since 2019. Um, we've performed over 675 upgrades, upgrading antennas, uh, emergency generators, adding spectrum to keep up with capacity demands. Um, as you probably uh, all are aware, we're using our phones more, data, data, data. Um, that's grown 520,000% since we introduced the first iPhone in 20, uh, 2007. So uh, AT&T now has 227 cell towers in Vermont providing um, LTE, 4G LTE across the state um, for both AT&T customers and also first responders uh, through FirstNet. And let me just say a little bit about FirstNet. Um, back in 2017, the federal government put out an RFP to build a um, nationwide uh, interoperable network that provided priority and preemption for first responders. Um, AT&T won that contract. It's a 25-year contract. Our commitment is to uh, invest $40 billion over that 25 years. We're, we're in year five right now. And our commitment through that uh, contract with the federal government, the First Net Authority, uh, is to build 36 sites in Vermont, uh, of which we've built 31, and we have um, five remaining sites that uh, we plan on completing this year. So again, but in total, along with our business as usual, we built um, 51 cell sites over the last um, four years or so. There's still work to do. We realize that. Um, we have another uh, uh, total of 12 sites that are in progress somewhere in the permitting or construction phase that will be completed uh, this year. Um, again, with our first net obligation with Vermont um, and in our contract with the federal government, we have um, you know remote places in the state that it's just not viable to go with commercial service. Um, and and we're, we've been doing that through FirstNet. Um, <clears throat> At the same time, we need to densify our network um, for the reasons that I suggested, just the capacity demand. We need to add capacity in places like uh, Burlington, South Burlington, Chittenden County uh, in general, and then um, Stowe, Vermont would be another area that um, you know we see a lot of a lot of traffic increases. Um, it's you know mostly year round, and and uh, the access road going up is a very busy spot. For all of the providers, um, so that's an example. So um, on 248A and in that process, you know, we pride ourselves in working with municipalities. Um, we've had meetings with towns in a majority of uh, the majority of the time that we've proposed towers. Uh, if the town wants a meeting, they 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 have one. Um, 248A is sort of a, a one-stop permitting process. Uh, which gives substantial deference to a town's um, recommendation based on the town's ordinance. And again, if the town wants to have a public hearing, they have a public hearing, um, which is the case the majority of the time. Um, in all, we, we've attended over 100 uh, meetings with municipalities and regional planning commissions to both explain our coverage needs and objectives and to listen to municipality concerns. Um, at and has made changes to the original proposed design um, for about half of our proposed uh, sites, including, um, you know, maybe a, a change in height, uh, maybe lowered it, uh, moved it um, to another parcel, uh, aesthetic design uh, concerns, environmental concerns, et cetera. So um, we've also suspended the timeline with 248A. Um, voluntarily to perform maybe a, a second balloon test for the residents to see, um, conduct more environmental studies, um, or to work out mutually acceptable solutions with the town. 
Um, in some cases, we've totally aborted uh, a particular cell site because of town concerns and moved someplace else um, within the town. Um, 248A uh, also encourages companies to co-locate uh, on existing towers, which AT&T and other providers do whenever that's feasible. Um, most municipalities have neither the desire nor the expertise to review telecommunications applications, given that the PUC and the department uh, have been doing most of that work over the last 10 or 12 years. In fact, um, the Vermont firm that does uh, all of the permitting for AT&T um, is frequently instructed by municipal officials not to file a local telecom permit and to use 248A. <clears throat> the need to expand and upgrade our Vermont network will be continuous. Um, certain, certainty is, is very critical when it comes to planning investments and building out a network. Um, as, as has been said earlier, 248A was enacted in 2007 with a sunset in 2009. Um, since then, I think four times it's been extended by uh, two or three years and it's currently due to sunset on July 1st. So once again, I, I ask the committee to support um, H110 um, and consider making 248A permanent. If permanence isn't an option, um, certainly consider a 10-year extension. And one other suggested amendment, if, if there's going to be amendments made to this, would be to give the PUC the authority to review and process what is called eligible facilities requests um, applications in accordance with the requirements of Title 47 with the federal code. Um, the same way that a de minimis modification are processed with 248A. So this would allow for substantially easier, easy, easier minor modifications, including adding backup generators, compound expansions, microwaves, additions, tower replacements, um, and, and the like. So in, in closing, um, I would be remiss if I didn't refer to another bill that is out there uh, dealing with 248A. Uh, I would assume at some point that this committee will um, take up H70. Um, that bill raises a lot of concerns for AT&T, and I think we would have a lot more to say about that bill. So thank you again for this opportunity and uh, certainly answer any questions that I can. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'll start. I'm curious how often are you, like how many of your towers are shared with other providers? Um, I don't have the exact uh, percentage, but I, I would I would take a guess at 80 or 90 percent. Um, however, over the last four or five years, um, because of FirstNet um, and our obligations, we have gone to some places that um, no one's gone to before. Sounds like a Star Trek uh, saying, but essentially, we've gone to places where there was not a business case to go. And, um, you know, one example uh, would would be um, at the, the Snow Bowl. Uh, we just recently turned on a tower top of the Middlebury Snow Bowl uh, in Ripton. Um, it's a, it's a mammoth site. Um, it was a site that uh, ended up costing us uh, almost $4 million. Um, and, but it's a great site. It provides lots of coverage. Uh, my guess is that um, other carriers will follow. So there's, there's uh, in, in fact, the majority of the sites that we've built, or at least of the 31 that we built, the total of 36, are in areas that are very difficult to permit. There's a reason why there's no cell coverage there. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll get there and, and I'm sure others will follow. So a couple of follow-ups. Um, does the first net have to go through the same review process? Yes. And when you say other carriers will follow, they'll join on your tower? Yeah, so so that's that's called a co-location. And uh, we, we all, none of us own a lot of the towers. There's usually third parties that own them. And um, that's not true in all cases. But um, you will see AT&T, T-Mobile, um, Verizon, um, VTEL maybe uh, on, on the same towers, providing close to the same coverage. You know, it's there's different heights, 
and we all can't be at the same height. So the lower you are, the lower you are on the tower, the less coverage you will get. If you're on the top of the tower, you'll get the most coverage. But that's called a co-location, and yes, that's done the majority of the time. Yeah, I just wanted to be sure because uh, that's my neck of the woods, and um, it was very surprising to many of us to see that tower go up, and it's right there on the edge of the wilderness and the spine of the Green Mountains, and I'm hoping we don't see too many more in our neighborhood. Is that, is that I'm sorry, is that the Ripton? Yep. Right, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good tower, and, and one of the reasons that it is such a great tower is we really don't want to build any more towers in that area if we don't have to. Yeah, great. <laughs> it, it is, it's, and it is out of ski area, and that's, that's good, and it does provide service where, where there was a gap. It's also a change. <laughs> uh, do members have questions? Representative Sibelia. Just uh, So let me just start by acknowledging um, uh, a number of, um, kind of community resilience projects that I'm aware of that AT&T has done uh, over time in Vermont, including responding to emergency issues after Tropical Storm Irene, um, a uh, hospital uh, in southern Vermont that had lost coverage, um, you know, getting some of our more, um, our, our villages with really deteriorating copper line, some small cell coverage. Um, and so, and thank you, Owen. I know you have been a big part of making that happen. Um, my questions, I have, I have uh, questions that will not surprise you. Um, of the uh, 100 million investment uh, that AT&T has made in Vermont in the last five years, I think that's what you, the figure you used, was 100 million in five years. Um, how much of that was first net uh, funding? Um, well, all of it was AT&T funded because we haven't uh, received any money from uh, the first net authority yet. So, um, that that has been to uh, build, um, well, as I said, 51 sites over the last three years. If you, if you go beyond that uh, since opt-in, um, we've actually built more than the 51 sites. Um, but those those are really it's been since uh, 2019 that we've turned on some of the first net sites and our business as usual. So at this point, um, all of that. All of that is first net. No, all of it is AT and T. Okay, and how much of that is FirstNet build in the last five years of that hundred million dollar investment? So uh, we have uh, again fifty one sites we've turned on, and not all sites are created equal, as we just heard about Ripton at almost four million dollars. But um, so we've turned on fifty one towers since twenty nineteen, and uh, thirty one of those is FirstNet. Are, and, and as as you, I think, know, Representative Sebelia, when all is said and done, it makes no difference because whether it's an AT&T site, which, which means we budgeted for it as our business as usual, or a first net site, which we're obligated to do, um, when all is said and done, it works for first net, first responders, and AT&T subscribers. I guess my question is trying to understand the level of public investment versus private investment um, in that. And so with FirstNet, you will be reimbursed if, if you have not received any money. Is that right? Yes. Partially. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, I don't understand um, exactly how all of that works. But yes, there is some funding coming from the FirstNet Authority. But keep in mind, we've also committed to spend $40 billion of our own funds over the 25 year period. That's not first net. Uh, yes. Uh, are there any other federally funded or, or federally reimbursable projects in the last five years outside of first net that you all have done? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Not, not, not in Vermont, certainly. Okay, thank you. And then my last question, actually I have two questions. So I wanna ask you about the thing that you asked about eligible facilities, but that's not if we could wait for a second on that. Uh, what does not fall under your data caps? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What does not fall, fall under your data caps for your cellular customers? So is there anything that's exempted from that that uh, is not part of, that's not counted towards data caps? 
I don't I don't believe so. So on a, a subscriber's bill when they get data. Yeah. So you you've got you've got voice, right? You've got text and you have data. Yeah. Um, and data is uh, really anything that you're doing on you know the internet uh, and a lot of the apps that you would be using on your wireless phone will use data. Yeah. So there's been a lot of consolidation in telecommunications companies. And so I'm not actually sure what other companies AT&T is affiliated with now, but my question is more around, um, at one point, I, I don't know if you still are, you were affiliated with um, DirecTV. And, and so it was more a question of, you know, are those companies exempted? Are those services, streaming services, other things exempted from your data caps? No, they they aren't, and um, as you may or may not know, we we do not own Directv anymore. Um, we we uh, spun that off. We're we're a shareholder, um, but we we do not operate Directv anymore. Okay, and then if you could just uh, t explain to me just a tiny bit more about the um, eligible facilities request, um, just in a little bit more detail, what that means. Yeah, so there's uh, some federal guidance um, uh, that it, it falls under Section 6409 uh, from the FCC. And essentially, it's for de minimis type projects, smaller projects that um, the FCC would like to expedite. And, um, you know, some of some of the some of the examples I mentioned would be, you know, placing a generator uh, at a cell site for whatever reason didn't have a generator. As you know, we took over this network about 12 years ago, 14 years ago now, and uh, some of some of those sites um, may not have generators. The majority of our sites do, but we want to add a generator to a site. Um, we want this to fall under um, this eligible facilities request. If we want to put a microwave. Um, link, you know, which would be a, an antenna up on a, a cell tower, uh, that would fall under um, this el eligible facilities request. If we want to redo a tower, you know, not make it any, you know, taller than uh, 10 extra feet or 20 extra feet, uh, go any wider, but just um, rebuild it to, to hold more capacity, maybe another provider uh, would like to be able to get that expedited through an eligible facilities request. Now that sounds very similar and it is to uh, the de minimis level of projects um, that, that currently is available through 248A, uh, but this takes it a little bit uh, of, of a step further, includes some more, um, uh, you know, it's expanding a shelter, for instance, at the bottom uh, of, of a site, something that um, is gonna be very, uh, minor uh, in the scheme of things, so that's basically what I'm talking about. And giving giving the the F, or excuse me the PUC the authority to um, and responsibility to review that process. So, are there any public notice requirements as a part of that federal? Um, is it a bulletin? Is it a, what is it? It's 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 similar to um, the the uh, de minimis uh, process that has. That is in within 248A, and I'm I'm not an expert on 248A, but uh, with a de minimis piece, um, there is a 30 day notice. Okay. So oh, yeah. So are you requesting that that the, the 248A de minimis be replaced with this federal procedure? Yeah, it, it, there, there wouldn't be a, a need for de minimis if this was in. And it's again, it's very similar. It's just um, it, it's expedited. It includes a few more items, and it's it's already a federal guideline. And there's just been some confusion, uh, maybe not confusion, but um, uh, the the my understanding is that the, the PUC doesn't feel that uh, they have that authority today, and and. We, it would be great if they were given that authority. If, if in fact they don't have it today, so they they would be administering it. Yeah, and it's so it's not duplicative now. It's not doesn't apply because we have the de minimis in two forty eight. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Now I th again I'm not the expert here, but I think if we wanted to um, 
use the, the federal 6409 on some of this stuff, we we could. Um, uh, it, I don't believe that we could use it through 248A, but I think we could use it through Act 250 and local zoning, which we really don't want to do. And it, so yeah, we, we would rather not do that. We would rather continue to use 248A and, and just have that eligible facilities request uh, made a part of that. Okay, thank you. Members have further questions? All right. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And next up we have Stephanie Lee uh, from New England Verizon and um, Stephanie's also joining us from Zoom. Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Good morning. Hi. So um, thank you so much um, for giving us at Verizon the opportunity to talk about 248A and the benefits um, of that particular um, statute. Um, thank you, Chair Sheldon and Vice Chair Sibelia and all the members of the committee. Um, I am Stephanie Lee. I lead state and local government affairs for Verizon in New England, and I have been representing Verizon in Vermont um, for about four years. I'm here today, um, as I mentioned, not only to support um, 248A, but also um, to express support for House Bill 110. Um, Section 248A, um, as you know, does provide a streamlined process that enables wireless providers such as Verizon, the opportunity to expand our network in areas where there's a need for more coverage and capacity. We like the statewide process um, and it has worked well because it provides an efficient framework that not only provides predictability for applicants and the communities we're serving, but for um, consumers in Vermont who are relying on wireless services to stay connected, whether it be public safety, um, to their jobs, um, school, um, healthcare, as well as their family and friends. We believe the statute does offer an effective job of balancing the interests of the um, local communities and the applicants. And each year Verizon also invests millions of dollars to improve the quality of service and coverage of our wireless networks um, for consumers in Vermont. And um, similar to at and we have invested um, about 60 million over the last five years. Um, and we are, looking at ramping that up in the next several years um, as we continue to focus on bringing um, our services in more rural areas um, to reach unserved and underserved residents. Verizon's um, we'll be increasing our investments. We're going to be doubling our investments this year, and that will probably increase exponentially over the three, three to five years to ensure that um, we can bridge those gaps for consumers wherever they are in Vermont. Um, as we look towards the future, we would ask the committee to consider extending Section 248A um, sunset beyond the three years, because that would, again, give us that predictability as we take a long range view of our network requirements um, and provide for more certainty in the planning and budgeting process. Our ultimate goal is to reach more consumers as quickly as possible with the fast, reliable service that they deserve and desire. And we appreciate the opportunity um, to discuss the benefits of 248A. I did want to also mention, um, as Owen did, that the other bill, um, H, uh, House Bill 70, um, does add a lot more onerous requirements that are concerning to us. We really like the process right now um, as it's been established, um, but we would be concerned that it would slow down the process because it adds more days to the front end before we even go to the Department of Public Service. Um, and it could really slow down our ability to ramp up our investments and ensure that we are reaching as many Vermonters as possible as our plan continues to accelerate in the next few years. I'll take any questions. Members have questions. Representative Sibelia. Yes, good morning, uh, Stephanie. Nice to see you again. Uh, a question for you around uh, any federally funded investments that you have made in Vermont in the last five years or federally reimbursable investments that you've made in Vermont in the last five years. 
No, all of our investments in Vermont have been um, out of Verizon's budget and will continue to be everything that we're proposing right now. Um, we have not applied for any federal stimulus funds in Vermont. Okay, and then uh, around data caps with Verizon? So Verizon has unlimited plans, um, and with those unlimited plans, you we do not have data caps. Um, however, um, there are different plans. Like through we we acquired Track Phone, and they have a prepaid service, so it, it you pay for what you get um, in advance. Um, and there are some services that are that are measured. But if you go with the unlimited plans, which really are the most cost effective plans, and we have them at different levels of um, amounts of data, um, we do not cap out. Okay, and so for your lowest plan, I would be interested, I don't know if you have this information with you right now, and if not, I'd be happy to have that as a follow-up. For your lowest plan, uh, lowest cost plan, track phones, others for low income um, Vermonters with the data caps, uh, what is exempted from the data caps? Sure, let me follow up with you on that. I could easily get that and send it to you following this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's it, Madam Chair. Thanks. Representative Bongar. Uh, hi. Is there a coordination between um, AT&T and Verizon to when this build out is sort of nearing completion, will there still be areas of the state that are not served? Will there be rural, can, rural areas of the state that um, still have no good cell service? Or is there a plan to actually do the equivalent of last mile? Well, I, I can get started since I'm on. So our goal is really to reach as many um, consumers as possible in Vermont. And that's why we're, we're ramping up this plan as we're all aware and been um, reminded through the pandemic how important connectivity is. Um, it does take time to get to everyone, but the goal is to get to as many people as possible. However, there are situations where, you know, Vermont is a, a mountainous state. It's very rural, sometimes wireless facilities in service. It can be difficult to reach every last person based on just how the network works. If there's, um, you know, mountains, if you're in a valley or um, in a very, very wooded area, it can be challenging without having, you know, d equipment in your home. But the goal is to really reach as many people as possible um, as we continue to build out. I have one, one town where I hear constantly when we talk about wireless that always says, don't forget about cell. <laughs> so, um, Okay. Good. Further questions? Not seeing any. Thank you for your testimony this morning. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me testify today. All right, members, that's all of the scheduled witnesses we have for today. Um, sort of public service announcement. Uh, oh, actually, Avram, would you be prepared to tell us about? The bill you introduced, H70, that came up a couple of times, or um, just in, at, at a high level. Yes, yes. that's what all. The just intent, to, what yeah. the intent is, I did not want to get into a discussion with it. No. To, uh, but I'll, I'll just say very briefly, the intent is to get bad actors, such as the one that that proposed the project in uh, in my town, to act, to do what AT&T and Verizon do and, and, and to, to go through a, a, a more communicative process with the communities. So that's the intent, whether there are specific things that that they would like to see change. I'm, I'm personally open and Representative Carrie Dolan and I are the sponsors of that, but, but yes. Okay, great. Ask a clarifying question. Yes. That. So that's referring to the municipal level process that they were discussing. That is not. It's, it's, uh, um, so that's referring to the municipal level process for citing that you're talking about re rather than the 248. Yeah. Okay. No, it's that the um, what those the two companies that we heard from today go through a fairly extensive informal communication process in the communities mm -hmm. before they file a notice that they're going to be uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, submitting a, an application. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that gives everybody the opportunity to, to learn about it and to um, uh, say, well, could you do this? Could you move this a little bit over, you know, to see if there are accommodations that can be made. That's not what happened in the, the, uh, the project that Jim Porter referred to that was withdrawn. That's Worcester. Gotcha. Um, uh, and it happened uh, uh, last last spring, basically. So, in other words, you're asking for there to be municipal level. In other words, you're asking for there to be municipal level stakeholder engagement. Um, prior uh, to notice. Yes, I, I don't want to. I'll, I'll get into this more in detail. But in in that case, um, the town was notified, and it was because the town officials went and told everybody in town that this uh, application. Uh, was happening otherwise no one would have would have known mm. uh, and that mm. that happened in Worcester that might not happen in, in another town mm. um. so if I'm understanding correctly we have this issue also with Act 250 where some developers will do a lot of pre um, pre proposal outreach in a community but it's not required and that's this sounds like a parallel thing where some providers might do outreach more actively before they propose it and get input before they actually finalize their proposal and your bill would um, require that out that public engagement yeah, and i think the question in the balancing is how how specific are the requirements or how much are we simply asking that when you come in with an application we want you to also include what outreach you did rather than you know, getting too specific, you must do this meeting and this, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's that's the uh, uh, the, the the balance. Uh, just speaking as someone that went through the two forty eight utility process a number of times, uh, it's to the benefit of the proposer to do to do that yeah. because if someone says, well, could you move it over to you know this corner of the property? Uh, you can say. Yeah, we, you know, we can do that, or yeah, it'll cost us a little bit, but if it makes, if, you know, if it makes people uh, be okay with it, then it's in the interest of the proposer, whether it's a, a communication tower or, or energy related. All right, great. Thank you. Further discussion on the testimony we heard this morning? I just have a quick question. So we don't... Um, we don't want to make this a permanent requirement or, the, or, or a permanent extension that they, they prefer the three-year check-in. Well, I think that we just took testimony. They prefer it to be extended permanently if, right. and then if not permanently, at least 10 years. And yeah. then other testimony we heard was like stick with the way it is three okay. years. I, I was late. I apologize for that for a work thing. So I, I think I heard the three-year is okay testimony and not the but well, it does yeah. seem that 248a is beneficial um so i guess i understand why folks would want to extend it longer but that's not what you're proposing <coughs> vice chair Sebelia. Okay. no and i'm in i'm happy to um explain why sure um so uh this is an unregulated, massively publicly funded um, industry, uh, which uh, is, um, uh, it's, it's an unregulated, massively publicly funded industry. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of concerns around data privacy. I have a lot of concerns around net neutrality. Um, when we have, we're federally preempted from um, regulating mm -hmm. uh, these providers. Right. Uh, we can do some consumer protection work, but it's been very difficult to hold these folks accountable, both right. for coverage or for the dollars that have been invested in them. And so this is literally our only way that we actually get to talk to them is by this sunset. But you don't want to permanently we won't we'll have no means of having them come to talk there'll there'll be no reason for them to oh, come no, to talk I, to us. I mean permanently extend just you know make that um not sunset it ever so if we saying. don't sunset it yeah 
there will be no reason for them to come and talk to us. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Under okay, gotcha. Okay. Because they'll get their certificate mm -hmm. and then never have to check back in again. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. And um, you know, I believe I'll have to double check, but I believe that the request. Uh, for us to put in federal law into um, 248 would lessen the requirements that we have. And again, you know, without, uh, you know, uh, these folks are critical um, for Vermonters, but they're not accountable to Vermonters mm -hmm. and they don't have to be accountable to, for, for the public investments that are made into them. Mm -hmm. And so this is almost our only way of holding Accountable. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, members, um, we're going to um, move towards taking a break, but I want to remind folks there's a budget adjustment caucus of the whole at noon. Um, so, our early um, break from committee will give you time to get lunch and get to that. And also, uh, we're back at 115.